question. So Dr. Ramson is a postdoc at Fermilab working on a couple of big experiments due with neutrinos. He got his PhD at University of Michigan in applied physics um, and has worked with NASA and, and other agencies before that. Um, you know, we do, I, my group does some work with Fermilab looking at the, the shielding and activation issues around some of the accelerators there. And so I thought it would be interesting to bring in somebody with a slightly different take from our normal nuclear engineering kind of system, but, but still in the nuclear physics realm and related so that we can sort of stretch our minds and hear some interesting new ideas here. So uh, with that, please uh, go ahead. And, and uh, Dr. Emson said also that he's happy to entertain questions throughout. So if you have a question, you can either throw it in the chat or you can just unmute yourself and, and interrupt, I think is okay with him, so. Let me bring up the chat if I can do that. All right, I am now taking a look at the chat. Now I need to get this off of here. Yep. All right, cool. So hi, everybody. Um, I was already introduced, but I can introduce myself. I'm Dr. Brian Ramson. I'm a postdoc at Primary Lab. I'm looking for a job. Hire me. Um, but seriously, um, I, I, it's hard for me to stress um, sort of the context or how, how cool this whole Dune collaboration thing is. Um, so you might not have heard of it yet. Fermilab is the, the, the nation's leading particle physics institutions lab. You can think of it sort of, oh, I'm sorry, particle physics institution. You can think of it sort of as uh, we are America's equivalent of CERN and Dune is gonna be the big boy at Fermilab for the next 10 years. It's gonna be on the equivalent, it's, it's gonna be as, about as big as the LHC. So it's good for me to talk to everybody, as many people as I can about Dune and also talk about some of the work I'm doing. I'm really excited to be here. Um, the other thing I wanted to say is, uh, it, it, Paul already sort of said it, this is sort of particle physics. It's, it's, it's really deep in the particle physics. I think you guys will have some understanding of what's happening here. I brought a lot of it down to the colloquium level. Um, again, if you have any questions or anything you don't understand, please interrupt me. I have no problems taking questions and I like to have conversations. All right, so with that, let's get started. So I called this talk using the whole buffalo. And the reason I did is because um, Native Americans have this, this, this uh, sort of rule that when they kill a buffalo, they try to use all the parts of it. And I tried to do some of the same thing with this uh, far detector prototype. I think I'm the only one, or I was the first one to try to use all the subsystems in parallel to do anything. So this should be cool. So first, Let's talk about what DUNE is. So DUNE stands for the Deep Underground Neutrino Experiment, and it's a future accelerator-based multi-detector long baseline neutrino oscillations experiment. That's a mouthful. We'll talk about what all that means. Um, so basically it means you have uh, a, uh, a particle beam, which will be neutrinos produced at Fermilab. There's gonna be a suite of detectors underground at Fermilab that's gonna do some initial measurements of the beam. And then you're gonna to wait to see what happens to that beam. And when I say wait, I mean, you're gonna wait for that beam to travel 1300 kilometers through the, through the earth and then measure it at another research facility. Uh, the reason we wanna do this is because neutrinos oscillate. Uh, they oscillate over space and time. We'll talk about that in a bit, but we hope that um, Dune will measure with greater precision what's known as leptonic CP violation, which colloquially is known as Delta CP. Um, we're going to nail down, yes, those dinosaurs are to scale, Katie. <laughs> uh, I put this picture in here to make sure that you guys are paying attention. Um, we're going to measure some of the parameters of neutrino oscillations. I'll talk about what that means. Um, we're also going to try to nail down the neutrino mass hierarchy, which are part of the oscillations thing. Uh, but outside of oscillations, we're also going to try to observe or further constrain proton decay. And if we are very lucky, uh, we will observe a, the, super, uh, the core collapse of a star, which is a supernova, and that, has, that, that produces a lot of neutrinos. Okay. So let's back up a bit again and talk about neutrinos in particular. So I think if you are in nuclear physics or you're doing any sort of nuclear uh, interactions, if you're looking at beta decays, uh, positron emissions, which I think are just beta pluses, and I think... Uh, what is it, some gamma decays, you should see some neutrinos. Um, but for us, uh, well, so the neutrinos would only be producing those interactions, but for us, neutrinos have an, an entire life, an entire story outside of just, you know, how they're producing nuclear interactions. So the most important thing uh, about neutrinos is that they're only 
they only interact using the weak nuclear force. So if you look at this guy on the right, this chart, what you're seeing are uh, the interactions of the uh, mass and force carrier particles that are in the chart on the left. And what you see is that the leptons, you have your neutrinos and your electrons, your muons and your tiles, but the leptons only interact using the weak bosons. And that means that they don't interact very much at all, because the only way that you're going to see any, any evidence that they were there is through a nuclear decay. Uh, so this means if you're looking for neutrinos, uh, to, to give you some sort of sense of scale, if you were to shoot a neutrino through, I think it's like six light years of lead, uh, you would see one interaction, where it would interact only once, and it would only interact after going through that, on, on average, after going through that entire six years, or six light years of lead. Uh, it's also true that neutrinos are the lightest elementary particles in a standard model. So right now, the current limits on the mass of a neutrino is about 1 eV, um, and that's plus or minus 100%. Um, so to give you a comparison, an electron is 511,000 eV. So the lightest particle we can think of, the electron, is 500,000 times heavier than an electron neutrino. And the thing that we care about at Primulab, the thing that we're measuring, is uh, the third important property, which are that neutrinos are superpositions of hidden mass states. And this means because they're superpositions of hidden mass states, those mass states interact differently uh, with space and time as uh, the wave function uh, evolves. And that means they oscillate. OK, so let's talk a little bit about oscillations. So if you look at the top, there is a charge current Lagrangian. And this is sort of the, where we the starting point for where we do all of our particle physics interactions. And what you're looking at on the left side after the, the, the funny LCC is an interaction between a W boson, uh, a lepton of some sort, and a neutrino. And if you look on the right side of that, of that equal sign, what this is actually saying is that when you interact with a neutrino of a particular flavor state, you're in fact interacting with multiple mass states at the same time. And the way you know that you're looking at these multiple mass states is you're looking at this U alpha I. This is sort of what mediates the, the communication between the flavor states and the mass states. So if, uh, if you look at this picture that is, um, uh, halfway on the slide, you can think of it as like, uh, you produce a source, a neutrino source, or you produce a neutrino of a, of a particular flavor. And depending upon what you put in your detector, uh, you can sort of pick the probability of the flavor you want to you wanna see. Now, that doesn't mean that you'll actually see uh, that flavor, but you have the greatest chance of seeing that flavor oscillation uh, depending upon where you put your detector. And again, this guy is mediated by this U alpha I matrix. And you can sort of think of that, uh, uh, you can sort of, conceptualize that as just a rotation between two different bases. So think of it like uh, two X and Y, um, two X and Y planes that you're trying to translate from one to the other. And uh, the rotation of one with respect to the other can be represented by just an Euler angle. So this is literally just, you're changing the rotation of two different bases and you can represent uh, at least in, uh, with, with two dimensional flavor and mass states, all that with just one Euler angle. If you move that to oscillations in 3D, which is what's actually happening in the standard model, you get this PMNS matrix, which is at the top left of the page. And the PMNS matrix is divisible or decomposable or di diagonalizable into three different matrices, which are all dependent upon neutrinos from a particular source. So of course you have your neutrinos that can, or the neutrinos you can measure from cosmics that interact in the atmosphere. And those are just called at the atmospheric source. You can, it turns out you can actually put neutrino detectors or next to nuclear reactors and look at uh, smaller scale oscillations from that. And then there are also particular uh, neutrino uh, signatures that come from the sun that you're able to observe those oscillations as well. And you can represent all of this as you move from a, two-dimensional rotations or three-dimensional rotation, you move from needing one Euler angle to three Euler angles, which is what you're seeing below that PMNS matrix. And in addition, you also have this delta CP parameter. And this describes the translation um, or the, the, 
how the flavor and mass states interact with either antineutrinos or neutrinos. And the difference in that interaction has implications for all of the standard model. And in fact, it would tell us why um, matter, why we are matter as opposed to antimatter, or, is it, or it at least acts as a model for how we could, for how that would happen. If you look below that, you can also see that the um, mass states, which are new one, new two, and new three, can also be represented as a superposition of flavor states. And we use that to sort of uh, not only measure the, new, the, the neutrino masses, but it, there's also an ambiguity um, about whether the heaviest or whether the third, excuse me, the third neutrino mass state is actually lighter or heavier than the other two mass states. And this is called the neutrino hierarchy or the mass hierarchy. Um, it's possible that the third mass state is lighter than the other two, and that would be the, an inverted hierarchy, which also has implications for all the particle physics because these neutrinos would be the only, um, the only types of particles that showed an inverted mass hierarchy. We'd need all sorts of new physics to explain why that happened. So this is sort of the cutting edge of where we are with that whole um, flavor matrix or PMNS matrix measurement. What you're looking at on the y-axis is a measurement of theta 2, 3. And if we go back, that would be the atmospheric um, neutrino sector. It turns out that accelerator-based experiments have access to both the atmospheric neutrino matrix or the angle and the reactor uh, angle. Um, and on the x-axis here, uh, you have delta CP, which is the, okay, so we have a question. So the PMNS matrix is about decomposing the potential sources of neutrinos. What is interesting because neutrinos from different sources have different properties. It's not that they have different properties, it's that they have different signatures. So they have different flavors and energies. And the, uh, the energy is what decides the length scale at which things oscillate. So you can, you can sort of pick out different uh, elements of that matrix and resolve them if you cleverly pick the sources. That's essentially what we did. So if we had had accelerator-based neutrino experiments when, this, when all of this theory was developed, we would, we would, instead of probably having an atmospheric and reactor matrix or an atmospheric and reactor Euler angle, we would have an accelerator Euler angle and, and only decompose it into two. So this is sort of a way to understand the oscillation, but it's not necessarily how the oscillations happen, if that makes sense. It's a choice that we made. Uh, could you go over real quick why there's more matter than antimatter? Yeah. So back in, in the beginning of the universe, um, uh, there was the Big Bang. And there were some cancellations that happened between matter and antimatter because they're supposed to be produced in the same amount. And the idea that, that, that there is more matter than antimatter means that I think the order is one in every 10 billion, for one in every 10 billion antimatter particles, there was an additional matter particle that did not annihilate. And the reason we think that happens can be explained by the same mechanism that, gives, that would give us a non-zero value of delta CP. I hope that makes sense. Uh, and the, to, to give you more detail, there are many different mechanisms that we, that we have for why that could happen and different values of delta CP pick different mechanisms. So I can't really tell you exactly why there's more matter than antimatter. We just know that there is, that, that, it, that that's the case. Yep. Um, oh yeah, so back to, this, back to this plot. So again, this is a state of the art. I work on NOVA. And NOVA is like the blue star. And our competitor is called TDK. And TDK published their result, which is the black square um, in nature last year. And what we're seeing here is that there's tension between these measurements. And of course, the uncertainties are large enough so that you can't ex exactly exclude both measurements. But this tension indicates that um, we're not doing even, even at our best. As far as the math goes, we're not, <laughs> we're not resolving the things we want to resolve. And this isn't because we're doing a bad job. It's because this is a very hard thing to measure because neutrinos are very difficult to, to really pin down. Um, so we hope that Dune, by doing something similar to NOVA, but in a much better way, will resolve this tension. In addition, we also hope that we can make statements about proton decay 
Um, so if you look on the right, what you have are possible ways that protons de can decay. And we also have the decay or the lifetime versus branching ratio for these different, um, for these different, uh, what's the word, uh, for these different modes of decay. Um, so I, I don't know if you know anything about protons, but they don't just randomly decay as far as we've seen. And if they do, um, then we have a mechanism for brand new physics. Uh, the, the two things you see on the left are uh, two of the most accessible candidates that Dune should be able to measure. One is if a proton decays in a way that produces a pion and an electron, which would have a particular signature in our detector, you would have an SU5 gauge mediated grand unified theory. And what that basically means is that you'd have a new force or something like a new force. If, you, if, if it decayed in another way that, that involved a strange meson, um, it would be evidence that you were possibly looking at uh, the presence of a supersymmetric grand unified theory, which is what they're looking for at the LHC. Now, the power here is that because Dune is so large, so, oh, okay, so let's back up. So the way you, you, you would want to observe uh, the decay of a proton is you either look at a single proton for, I don't know, billions of years, or you get a, a bunch of protons in one space, you heavily instrument it, you, you know, suppress or understand all your backgrounds, and you look to see if any protons randomly decay. Well, because Dune is so large, we have, we, we should have something on the order of five and a half times 10 to 32 nucleons available. So we can sort of set new limits for this and either constrain or, um, or possibly see a proton decay. Now, the other thing, and the th one of the things I'm really excited about is that Dune might have something to say about multi-messenger astronomy. Um, so the way, I, the way I always frame this is if you look at the last supernova that happened, and this was in 1987, I was born in 1987, we got about 25 neutrino events from that. And those neutrino events are very, they're low energy, they're only about a few to tens of MeV, and they're very hard to measure. So when we did this, when, when this thing exploded, we had every neutrino uh, detector in the world try to look for it, we only got 25 events. If something were to happen when Doom was completely operational, we would be able to observe the entire, it would, it would be like having, it would give us a time series of the neutrinos produced as a function of what was happening inside of the, of the neutrino, uh, I'm sorry, of the supernova. And it would be like taking a video camera or of, uh, uh, yeah, it would be like taking a video camera and pointing it at a supernova and then trying to figure out, you know, what happened in the supernova from looking at the video camera. That's the sort of um, uh, precision that we would have with Doom. And this, the way we know this is we've done all sorts of simulations with particular uh, uh, supernova properties. And we've seen, okay, well, if, if for example, if, if the neutronization period goes up to a particular number of events per bin, then we know that this sort of decay happened inside of the supernova and this, this dynamics happened with uh, the flow of mass in, inside the supernova. So this is the sort of precision we'll have. It'll be very cool. But in addition to that, Neutrinos also manage to, to get out of uh, these sorts of systems much quicker than the actual light because neutrinos don't really interact with anything. So we, we could also serve as an early, early warning system for something like uh, LIGO. We could say, oh, well, we've seen a bunch of neutrinos coming from this particular location in the sky. Uh, LIGO should be prepared to see, I don't know, something happening gravitationally, or we can point a, um, a telescope towards that same section of the sky and say, hey, you might, you might be able to observe a supernova. So Dune has a, has a pretty varied physics program that I'm really excited about. So we talked about a bit about what Dune can do. Let's talk a little bit more about what Dune is. Um, so again, it's two, it's two detectors. One's gonna be at Fermilab. One's gonna be at the Sanford Underground Research Facility. And I put two buffalo here. <laughs> Uh, specifically because one buffalo or uh, one group of buffalo is at Fermilab. We actually have buffalo on site if you've never been, you should come visit, say hi. But additionally, about an hour away from the Sanford Underground Research Facility in South Dakota, they also have an entire herd of buffalo in a, in a national park. Um, so that's one reason I showed this slide to stick more with the theme. But the other is that I wanted to emphasize that there's a matter effect here that gives us more sensitivity to this neutrino mass hierarchy. And the reason we have this effect um, is because we go pretty deep into the, uh, into the Earth's crust. So it turns out that neutrinos have sort of a resonance 
with electrons that antineutrinos don't have because there's no anti-electrons hanging out. And that allows us to have better sensitivity to this, this um, mass hierarchy that we were talking about. So the dune near detector is gonna be, again, at Fermilab, it's gonna be 62 meters underground. And it's in fact gonna be an entire suite of detectors. You're gonna have a gaseous argon near detector, liquid argon near detector, and that's to make sure that when we measure things that we're able to iron out systematics that come from the liquid argon near detector. Um, then we're also gonna have a, just a system that's just there to observe, to, to simply count what's coming from the beam. Um, and the idea here is that we want to not only understand neutrino interactions on liquid argon, on argon in general, on the argon atom, but we also want to have a good understanding of the beam flux. Uh, so then, in other words, the number of neutrinos coming through a particular space or coming through a particular area and the shape of that flux, which is sort of the distribution and energy of those neutrinos that are coming through a particular area. And this is the big boy. This is the dune far detector. This is again at the Sanford Underground Research Facility. And it's hard to really communicate how large and like it's gargantuan, right? The first thing it's gonna be a mile underground. So before you do anything, you have to go literally a mile underground. And then once you get there, you're gonna put four modules um, that are 17 kilotons in fiducial volume of liquid argon. To give you some sense of scale of how, how large one of these modules would be. Um, the module is 19 meters long, uh, wide, and that's the length of an 18-wheeler. It's 18 meters tall, which is about four, a four-story building, and it's 66 meters long, which is the length of a football field. And all of this has to, has to be filled up with, with super cool liquid argon and sent a mile and a half underground. So there are a lot of technical design challenges that come with doing this thing. So the first and second modules um, are already planned. They're gonna be single phase. And then there is a, uh, a, a third and fourth module. The third module, we are still trying to decide what it is. The fourth module, we're opening it up to experimentation. So I think I'm almost halfway through my time, so I have to speed up. Um, so let's talk about how the dune uh, single phase far detector should work. You essentially have a liquid argon TPC, which takes an energetic particle. And in this energetic part, uh, in, once you put an energetic particle in the medium, uh, this particle ionizes electrons from the argon atoms and also produces light. And without an electric field across this, this uh, without, the, without an electric field ac across this TPC, the electrons would just hang out because argon is typically uh, electrically, its valence shell is, is electrically neutral. So if you add an, an electric field, the electrons will drift. And if you have sense wires that can observe or can tell you when, uh, through changes in current, when electron contacts a sense wire, you can, you can use the correlation across different sense wires to sort of reconstruct where an event happened in 3D space. So for, in order for doing work, we would need about a 3.6 meter drift at about 500 volts per centimeter across the entire detector. To produce that, we'd need a modular electric field cage of 600 cathode plane assemblies and 150 anode plane assemblies. And we'd also need about 1500 photon detectors that would each be embedded in the APA. And this is just the requirements for a single module. If you look on the top right, you'll see sort of the setup of how a module should work. Um, you have anode, an anode plane assembly or an anode plane in the middle, sandwiched by two cathode planes, and then sandwiched again by two anode planes. And this thing, this is the actual fiducial volume, so this is where we'll measure things, where, 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 we, where we will measure things. This is 12 meters tall and 14 meters wide. And the important thing here is that in order for all this to work, your liquid argon has to be very, very pure. So if things work how we, how, how we think they're going to work, um, in other words, we, we need an average E field of a particular amount. Uh, we need a, an electron lifetime of about three milliseconds, which is very important. We need the PDS, the photon detection system. We need that light yield to be about half a photon per MeV deposited in the detector. And we need a, a decent time resolution. If all of that works how we think it's going to work, then we get uh, the mass ordering of five sigma in two years, which is incredible. 
right? I mean, right now, I think we're at two sigma with the two leading experiments um, for the mass ordering. We get delta CP for 50% of all delta CP values to three sigma within five years, which is incredible because right now we, we're seeing, you know, tension at one at the one sigma level between the leading experiments. If we're super unlucky and delta CP is at a value of like zero, in other words, there is no, there, there is no uh, delta CP, or we're at a value of, I think, negative pi over two, then we're still able to resolve at least constrain the actual value um, within, with, within something in order of a decade, which is just, it's, it's wild. I mean, we'll see many times, many thousands of times more events than the current leading experiments in something the size of Doom. Okay. Now this is where we come to my expertise. So um, a well-functioning PDS system is important for the operation of the entire Doom mission. The, the first reason is because it is able to improve the resolution of events that are produced by the neutrino beam by a factor of a thousand. So typically the way this works, your accelerator has some time constant or some duty factor and you time your, you would time your liquid TPC or your, your, your liquid argon TPC to um, accept events from the beam at the right timing. Um, your, your photon detection system would also give you an additional handle on calorimetry because 50% of the interaction energy in your de detection system is produced in the, uh, in the light or is dumped in the light. And uh, the, the most important thing is that um, in order to do proton decay or supernova burst in any sort of supernova observations, you need a, fo uh, a functioning photon detection system just for the triggering. Now, the problem is, is that the propagation of the vacuum ultraviolet light in this detector uh, or with liquid argon is just is not well understood right now. And this has been something that's plagued the, the field of, of high precision measurements for the past 30 or 40 years. So we can talk a little bit about how light is produced in the detector. Uh, essentially, you have, again, this charged particle that interacts with an argon atom. And even if you ionize or even if you excite the atom, but you always get to an excited dimer. And this excited dimer is produced either through, again, recombination or just because you have an excited argon atom. Um, and the scintillation light is produced when the, when the dimer decays. And this is one of the main reasons, or this is the main reason why um, the, the medium is completely transparent to, to the 128 nanometer scintillation. Now, this also means that the light can be produced in a singlet or triplet state, and that has large consequences on what happens with the light. So the majority of light is produced at the 128 nanometer short-lived excimer state, but if it goes through the the triplet state, the lifetime becomes 1.6 um, microseconds. And this gives us basically sort of a fog or a haze inside of, inside of the detector of light that we can associate with, it, with events. Now also the light is un isotropic and unpolarized, so this is good. And we should get about 40,000 photons per MeV without the electric field or 26,000 photons per MeV with the electric field. So that's how light's produced. This is how light travels. So the main effect we have to worry about is something called Rayleigh scattering, which is the same thing that happens with light from the atmosphere. Um, it's the reason why the sky is blue. Essentially, when light interacts with something that is much smaller on the order of, is it? Yeah, much smaller or is it the same size? I think it's much smaller. Um, the interaction goes like one over lambda to the fourth. And that means that the shorter wavelengths tend to scatter less than the longer wavelengths. Now you can represent the, you can, uh, yeah, you can represent this Rayleigh scattering thing as just a general attenuation. And you can sort of assign a measurement to that to show, to show you sort of the property of the medium. And if you look at previous measurements, um, the, the, the landmark measurement, the first, the, the, the first measurement that we really pay attention to is from Ishida and all. And they reported like a 66 centimeter Rayleigh scattering length, which meant that uh, you can think of this as um, it's the it's the length of light it's the it's the distance the light would have to travel to be reduced by a factor of one over e. 
Um, the next measurement we look at is the silanol, and that's sort of the calculation. And that gives us a value at 90 centimeters, which is about 50% different than what a sheet and all actually measured. Uh, this wouldn't be a problem, except calvo and all come in. Um, they're an argon dark matter uh, experiment. So they're very interested in precision measurements and doing things um, with no noise. So this is a very well trusted, a, a, a very trusted measurement. And this measurement agrees with Ishidanol in the beginning. But then I had some friends at CERN last year do a measurement and they completely disagree with, you know, the most trusted measurements and agree with this calculation that was done almost 20 years ago. So the question is, you know, there's a 50% uncertainty is a very important value. Uh, what are we going to do when it comes time to measure things in Dune? Well, we have Protodune to the rescue. Uh, so Protodune is sort of the prototype, it's the test bed of how we think Dune, how we think the Dune fire detector is going to work. So it's the same scale, but not the same size as the Dune fire detector. So we take all the parts that we would that we would put in the Dune fire detector, we we manufacture prototypes of them, and then we put them all in one detector and we try to do an experiment with it. So the single phase, um, the single phase proto Dune consists of four important parts, and I'm going to go over each of them because we need all the parts. Um, this picture here is to sort of tell you or to show, to show you how things are arranged over at CERN. So I went to CERN and, and sort of worked on this for about six months. So it's inside a building that's a kilometer long. Uh, this is, uh, if you can see my mouse, this is the single phase protodune. This is the um, cryogenic equipment. You have counting rooms over here. This is where people hang out and do a, a lot of the analysis. Uh, you have beam coming in right here. This is, for, this is protodune dual phase, which was a, an, an additional prototype that we don't really talk about anymore. <laughs> and then here are where you have your cosmic ray tiger things. And here's another picture that shows you from a different angle where everything is. Um, so again, you have your CRTs here. Here's where the beam pipe is. And you have your cryostat. And inside of your cryostat, you again have your APAs and your CPAs. APAs and CPAs stand for, stand for anode plane assemblies and cathode plane assemblies. Um, and again, this guy is full scale. So even the prototype is seven meters wide by seven meters long and six meters tall. So this thing was huge when I got there. So let's talk a, some, a bit about some of the parts. So we, we're using the same supply beam as the LAC. The only difference is we, um, we have it scattered on two different or, or two generations of targets in order to get tunable beam energies. We do that with just the magnets. Um, and then we also have an entire suite of beam measurement software, so that, or not software, beam measurement instruments, so that we can sort of know what we're putting into protodyne. Because the idea is we want to see how well we can build a, a detector that's like the Dune Fire detector. I'm not going to go over these particular parts. What I do want to emphasize is that we know pretty well what's happening here. So we can just from the time of flight and momentum, um, pick out what sort of particles we're looking at. And then we have a, a suite of Sharenkov detectors that allow us to really um, isolate the sort of particles that we want to look at and really identify how things are, are working. Um, this is sort of the assembly of the single phase uh, liquid, ar ar liquid argon TPC. Instead of having 600 CPAs and 150 APAs, and we have six APAs and 18 CPAs. Each one of these APAs is about six meters tall and about 2.3 meters wide. And this is what it looks like inside of the detector. The CPA is on the right, the APA is on the left, and you have a field cage to make sure that your field is uniform even as you approach the edge of the detector. And when we turned everything on, we were nervous. Uh, we do have uh, two drift volumes. And um, we were able to achieve our 180 kilovolt um, electric field across the entire thing. Um, this is an example of how well we were able to um, resolve pro, uh, protons and muons from the experiment. So that means that our, our um, energy loss measurement is, is, is really good. So we're, we're able to tell um, sort of the momentum of the particles by how much energy they throw off as they scatter from the argon atoms. Um, we, were, we developed machine learning 
uh, reconstruction software to sort of do this whole thing. And we had an energy loss function to sort of do this particle separation. What you're looking at here are, on the left are proton and muon stopping values. So in other words, the protons and muons di didn't have enough energy to make it through the, through the rest of the detector. We were, and we were able to do estimations of their stopping range um, using simulation. And doing all this, uh, we were able to do that on a half microsecond resolution with the liquid argon TPC, which is great. Um, but I really want to stress how good this separation is for something at the energies we're looking at. This is a spectacular operation, even if it's not readily apparent. And from that spectacular operation, you're able to do things like, you know, reconstruct particles in 2D um, to very high precision. So this is a 6 GeV electron candidate, and you know it's an electron because of all how basically how dirty the this this uh, the particle track is because it's constantly transitioning from a proton to an electron. Uh, and then you can also so this is you know our ability to resolve things on a small scale. You can also simultaneously resolve these large events like an entire cosmic ray shower. So on the left, color corresponds to the amount of energy deposited. And on the right, where, when you can reconstruct in the 3D, um, what you're seeing is that the, the color corresponds to the time um, when the event or particle happened. And what you can see is you can sort of build an entire story about what happened in this event. So the circle, is sort of where the beam comes in. And what you're looking at is a proton that's coming in, in, into the detector and interacting in many different ways, and then finally losing so much energy that it just decays or gets absorbed. And then you can see all these cosmics coming in at, at, at a later time. And then even before the beam comes in, you can also see that there are these higher energy cosmics that are streaming in and doing interesting things. So if we can do this sort of reconstruction with stuff coming from the beam, imagine the sorts of things we can do with actual neutrinos events. And we can you know, observe um, multiple neutrino events at the same time. So pile up is, is, is gonna be difficult for this experiment. In other words, we're gonna be able to resolve separate neutrino events at the same time, which is, is pretty awesome. We also have a cosmic ray tagger, which I talked about. It's mostly just uh, strips of scintillator that are upstream and downstream of the detector. I won't talk about what they are, um, but I will say that they have 20 nanosecond resolution as opposed to the half a microsecond resolution for the liquid argon TPC. And this is important because when we wanna use this to uh, track events, we're looking at a 60 nanosecond trigger coincidence, which also interacts with the sort of placement of the CRT. So there are an upstream and downstream module um, the upstream module is staggered because we had to make sure that we could fit the beam pipe in between both of them. And the beam pipe is pretty inflexible. Um, so this gives us really interesting effects on our acceptance that I'm going to talk about in a bit. Um, and the downstream CRT module is just behind the detector or downstream of the detector. Oh, another thing, uh, the upstream and downstream uh, CRT modules are staggered relative to each other in height. And that's because you wanna make sure that you're, you're getting as many cosmic ray events as possible and very few cosmic ray events go exactly horizontal. So finally, this is something, uh, this is what I was an expert on. Uh, I looked at, again, the photon detection system and the, the, the takeaway I want from this slide because I don't have time to go into detail is that this is sort of a technology demonstrator for the evolution of light collection technology as we sort of develop Dune. What you're looking at at the top is a dip coated detector, and it is sort of the most primitive detector that we designed, and we designed it, I don't know, five or 10 years ago. And essentially, you have a bar, which is just a polymer with, that's, that's, in a, that's been put into a, a wavelength shifting material or dipped in a wavelength shifting solution. And when scintillation light interacts with that the wavelength shifter, it gets shifted to 430 nanometers, and then the, the light internally reflects on the bar until it gets to the sensors, which are at the edge of the photon detector. If you look at this guy, this is sort of an iteration on the dip coated design. But then we move to this Arapuka concept, which is a completely new way of doing photon detectors that were developed by some folks in Brazil. And essentially what you have is instead of an entire bar, you have a chamber. And this chamber has a window that is that uh, has a dichroic filter sandwiched between two wavelength shifting materials. And, and the dichroic filter basically means that 
light can get in, but it can't get out. So you can think of it as sort of like a roach motel for, <laughs> for light. Um, so when, when, when the 128 nanometer light um, go, goes through the dichroic filter, it's then wavelength shifted so that it can't escape. And it, it's trapped in an internally reflective chamber until it's absorbed by a system. And this is supposed to increase efficiency over the other designs by, I don't know, some ridiculous factor. I won't, I won't reveal the number until we actually look at the results. But when we put this guy in here, uh, we did not understand how well it was going to work. And to give you some, some understanding, only two of these um, existed when we built Protodune and we put them in particular locations. The orange one is on the non-beam side and it was, designed, it was placed specifically to observe cosmics. And then you have one, which is this orange one right here, right in front of the beam. And the rest of these guys are the older style of technology. So let's talk a bit about the measurement. So essentially what I did is I used the trigger, which is sort of a way of how it works here, to coordinate uh, CRT triggers with particles that were measured in the TPC, and then I measured the light coming from them. And this was difficult because we had about three months to put together, to put together this entire detector and make sure it, it, it worked. So we didn't really have a lot of time to develop this strategy. And not only did I develop it, um, it is now used as like a standard light measuring uh, strategy in all liquid argon detectors that we're using from now on. So this is like how we're going to do measurements in Dune. Um, so the first thing we do is look for through going muons with a 60 nanosecond coincidence using the upstream and downstream CRT. Then we draw a, a sort of imaginary vector between the center of those CRT pixels. Um, and we compare that to the particle track. And this particle track is, is comes from particles in the TPC that sort of agree with this module. So in other words, we take the particle track from the TPC, project it forward, and if it, inter if, if it interacts with the upstream and downstream I'm sorry, not interacts, intersects with the upstream and downstream CRT uh, modules. Then we assume that that's the proper triggering particle. And then we look at the light from that particle. Um, once we look at the light, because we know where the particle track is in 3D space, we can then also assign a distance. So this isn't really a, a true attenuation measurement. It's sort of a pseudo attenuation measurement, but we did it with what we had on hand. So this is how we picked um, this is sort of a look at the sample. So if you look um, at the two top graphs, what you're looking at are the tracks projected up upstream and downstream to the CRT pixels. And what you can see is that you're actually painting the individual CRT pixels, which are about 1.6 uh, meters by 1.6 meters. I also wanted to show that we put in a quality cut of around 7.5 degrees between the imaginary uh, pixel vector and the actual particle track. And that uh, we basically looked at the comparison using uh, a simple equation, just a dot product. And if uh, the cosine theta of that value was greater than or was less than a certain amount, we, we tossed the track. And we got 1.13 million candidate events. And of the 1.13 million with this quality cut, we were able to accept about one out of every 21 or 22 events. So we got 43,000 events to do this analysis. Now, I wanted to emphasize again that we were able to do so well that we were able to resolve, um, or not resolve, we were able to, to really figure out what the effects of this acceptance on the upstream staggering was. It turns out that not only is there a particular um, acceptance effect that you can see geometrically, but um, because of the 60 nanosecond coincidence, that's actually not enough time for a particle moving at the speed of light to traverse the entire detector. And we were able to resolve that and show that and we, we changed it later. But for this measurement, we, 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 don't have, um, we don't have this measurement on one, on one half of the, of the detector and that would be the beam side. So the thing I wanted to come back to was this, this, this how efficient these, these, this new technology was supposed to be for the light detectors. And what we saw is that the, light detect, the new light detectors are at least 10 times as efficient as the other light detectors. Um, so it turns out that one light detector, one Arapuka, one of this new technology could do the job of an entire wall of the other sorts of technologies. And it was, it was pretty surprising when we figured this out. <laughs> we did not expect things to go that well. So this is a, a look at the data that we got. So again, on the, on the y-axis, 
is sort of the distance that we've uh, assigned to a sort of measurement of light on the x-axis. So the x-axis isn't exactly a measurement of light. Um, what we've done is we've done a simulation that used the exact same track and looked at the amount of light that would come from the exact same track if we simulated it. And then we divided the actual amount of light we saw by the amount of light we simulated. And we did that event by event. And what we saw is that the data and simulation agreed to within, so that was about one sigma. Uh, it agreed to around 19% uh, with a simulated Rayleigh scattering value of 90 centimeters. So that was sort of the development of the technique. So then we were able to compare simulated Rayleigh scattering values. And even though the relative difference between the two simulations were only about 5% as a function of the different Rayleigh scattering values, uh, we were able to resolve that the data agreed more with the 90 centimeter Rayleigh scattering value than the 60 centimeter Rayleigh scattering value. So from now on, all simulation, all things moving forward, we're going to assume that 90 centimeters is about the Rayleigh scattering or the major part of attenuation for light in the simulation medium. So that is the uh, particulars of sort of the measurement I did. In addition to this measurement, we also achieved almost all of our design goals. Well, not almost, we achieved all of them. Uh, <laughs> for Protodune operation, we use Protodune to sort of write the Dune fire detector TDR. That's the technical design report. So we used our experience from building Protodune to basically show that Protodune operates so well that we can push the designs of, of the Dune fire detector. And when I mean operate so well, I mean, we were able to achieve the average E-field we wanted. We didn't think we would get that high, but we did. Our electron lifetime was 30 times greater at maximum than what we needed. Um, our electron, uh, our, our, the noise on our electronics was about half of what we thought it would be. Um, the quality of our electronics um, meant that only about 20% of what we thought would fail failed during operation. And we got five times, as, I'm sorry, four times as much light as we thought we would and at a resolution that was one fifth of what we thought it would be. So um, yeah, it was a very successful experiment. And the only reason I was able to do this measurement of light was because uh, Purdue didn't operate it as well as it did. So yay, go us. <laughs> and that is about all, all I have. I think I'm on time. Yeah, that was great. Uh, perfect timing. Um, <clears throat> so we have time for a few questions, uh, if anyone has any, um, while you're all thinking of your questions. Um, so I, I have one that sort of connects back to the, the maybe to reconnect for us, how does, how will the signals from this detector differ depending on the flavor of neutrino and, and what, what you're, you know, what the oscillation of the neutrino and things like that? Ah, so I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't explain that very well enough. Okay. Well, maybe you did, but maybe I, it was at the beginning. So <laughs> yeah, so bad. Um, now that we've seen how the detector works, try and connect them back together. Yeah, so the way we get this number is we literally count the number of, or, or the way we get this graph is we, we count the number of electron, I'm not electron, of neutrino events we see in the far detector. Mm -hmm. And then we, we sort of uh, evolve that backwards through the oscillation to the near detector. That's why we need both. Yeah. And literally all we're looking at is the number of neutrinos we see and their energies. And we, our beam, we're able to make it, we're able to sort of change some configurations and make it shoot neutrinos or anti-neutrinos. So we're gonna be able to do the same thing with Dune. And the thing we're looking at, our beam produces muon neutrinos, which also is why we have access to these two different uh, reactor sections. Well, not reactor sections, uh, matrices, PMN, uh, diagonalizations of the PMNS matrix, uh, matrices, yeah. Um, so I hope that answers your question. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, I have, uh, I have, a, I have two questions actually, if you don't mind. Mm -hmm. Um, so I was wondering about the, the like particle track charts that you showed sort of in the middle. This is probably like a particle detection 101 question, but will neutrinos actually look like particle tracks on there or will they just be like a big splat of 
light? Because you mentioned that the liquid argon emits these scintillation light like isotropically. So will you just get like one big pour out of that or will it actually like show the direction? So it's both, right? And it, that's why the PDS system is, is interesting versus the liquid argon TPC system, right? So the liquid argon TPC system actually does give you directions. And what you'll see is a bunch of things coming out of a vertex. So you'll have a point and then you'll see things sort of exploding from the vertex. And when you see that, you know which way the neutrinos are coming from. So you can sort of kinematically understand um, that it's a neutrino from not only looking at the sort of decay that happened or the sort of interaction that happened, but looking at it at its direction. And then from the PDS, you'll get a corresponding flash. So it, it, it will look like a splat. And the thing is, the, the flash happens quicker than the, the, the creation of the event topology. So if you know exactly when the flash is, you can do interesting things like watch the event happen. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, that does. Yeah. And then I just wanted to ask, um, do you know like what are the what are the most important parts of this experiment that allow you to get the differentiation between the 55 centimeter result that the other group found versus your sort of strong, pretty strong evidence for the, the 90 centimeter wavelength? Do I, so you're asking me why I think this experiment preserves, uh, prefers 90 centimeters? Yeah. So what, what I really think is happening is that in these older experiments, let's see, I do some, I talk, here we go. In these older experiments, I really think what's happening is that they have impurities in their liquid argon that they never measured. So our ability to, to well, not only our ability, but we, we really want to make sure that we have super pure liquid argon. And the way we know we have super pure liquid argon is that our electron lifetime is super high. And many of these measurements, I don't think any of these measurements actually did a, uh, actually looked at their electron lifetime. So we know our, our liquid argon has to be X pure or X purity because our electrons are hanging out 30 times longer than we expected them to. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. So was it just not possible to obtain super pure argon in the past or was that not known to be as big of a problem as it is? I just didn't think people worried about it as much back then. Like I, I looked, I, I mean, I've read these papers and they don't, like they don't even, they rarely even mention the purity. They're just like, well, it's liquid argon. It's, it's you know, it's, it's it, doesn't, it doesn't absorb its own light. So <laughs> like we did the best we could. <laughs> <laughs> okay, gotcha. Yeah, thanks so much. Mm -hmm. The light collection that you talked about, the our, I can't remember the acronym, ARPUCO? Ar, 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 ARPUCO. ARPUCO? It, yeah, it's, 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 um, it's literally like a, there's like yeah. some native Brazilian. I'm Is sorry. that being used in other applications? So we're part of a consortium with the NNSA, and there's a lot of overlap here actually in little bits and pieces because one of their elements is looking at measuring neutrinos to to measure reactor performance and whether reactors are operating and things like that. And another big area is looking at um, next generation light collection approaches and moving away from photomultiplier tubes for radiation detection more broadly. So mm -hmm. is this being used in other domains? So right now it's being used in another liquid argon experiment called, uh, it's, it's the short baseline neutrino, uh, uh, short, short baseline neutrino program, which is also at Fermilab. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if it's used outside of liquid argon, I will say, I sort of put this, but didn't want to really talk about it. So we've been experimenting with sort of doping with xenon and trying to see how it changes the, the light collection ability. I can imagine that you could use the same design in a xenon detector and you would have advantages because the Rayleigh scattering scatters less. less. And is it, how much harder is it to have that many cubic meters of liquid xenon versus liquid argon? Um, well, the, the, the problem isn't, it, it's actually not hard at all. The, it, well, it's not hard to do practically. It's considerably more expensive. I mean, xenon is, I mean, liquid argon, you pull out of the atmosphere, right? Like yeah. it's, it's like 0.02% of the atmosphere or something like that. Liquid xenon, like, I don't actually, I don't know where you get xenon from, <laughs> but I know it's really expensive. It's like 10,000 bucks a bottle. I guess you wouldn't want to. Could you make a smaller detector or something? Would it would it be benefits? You know, yeah. The, the so quality of your signal might be better, but would there be other sort of engineering benefits? Um, so it's actually, if, if we could make Dune out of Xenon, we would. <laughs> it's just too expensive. <laughs> okay. 
Well, wait, wait, let me back up on that because xenon, once, once you put xenon in there, then the nuclear effects become in like, they're just really, really, I mean, argon's already difficult to deal with in terms of neutrino scattering from the nucleus. Okay. But with xenon, um, those problems would be amplified, but your light collection would be better. It's be a trade off there between those. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, any last questions for Dr. Ranson? All right, well, thanks a lot for that. Um, it sort of connects to a lot of the neutrino things that are going on in some of the work that I do. And um, interesting um, to hear how it all goes when you start actually trying to measure through all those dinosaurs. So. <laughs> Uh, Paul, could you send me an email and we can talk a bit more about the, the nuclear applications that you're thinking of? Sure, I'll do. We'll do that. All right, folks. Thanks for having right. me. Appreciate okay. It. Thanks, everyone, for coming. Um, enjoy the rest of your day. Get out and enjoy the sun. So. All, All right, right y'all. Bye, everyone. Bye.